Welcome everyone. I'm Ellen Ochoa, Chair of the National Science Board. We're delighted to be here today to brief you on Science and Engineering Indicators 2022, the congressionally mandated report on the State of US Science and Engineering, or SNE. This report is nearly two years in the making and is thanks to the hard work of the staff within the National Science Foundation's National Center for Science and Engineering Statistics, or NCSCS. I'd especially like to acknowledge the tireless efforts of the indicators authors. We'd also like to thank Amy Burke, Program Director for Indicators, Emilda Rivers, Head of NCSCS, and Skip Lupia, the former Assistant Director for Social, Behavioral, and Economic Sciences. I also want to acknowledge the leadership and dedication of my board colleague, Julia Phillips, who chairs the National Science Board's committee that oversees production of the report. Before we launch into the discussion of the indicators data, I'm very pleased to introduce the NSF director, Seth Raman Panchanathan. During his service on the National Science Board, before he became NSF director, we benefited from his tireless enthusiasm for SNE. And now we're all inspired by him as he leads us through an exciting new phase for the agency. Punch. Thank you so much, uh, Ellen, and uh, for the warm introduction. And, and I just, first of all, want to thank you for the inspiration that you bring and the fellow members of the National Science Board, including our leader, Julia Phillips of the Science and uh, Science Engineering Policy Committee. So we really appreciate all your efforts. It's truly an honor to join you all today for the rollout of the 2022 Science and Engineering Indicators. This report is the nation's most comprehensive source for high quality data on the status of science and engineering in the United States and plays a critical role in our guiding our strategic actions at NSF. This continued partnership between NSF and the National Science Board plays such an important role in the success of the science and engineering enterprise across our nation. And I'm so grateful for the board's continued support. I would also like to acknowledge the incredible work of NSF's National Center for Science and Engineering Statistics, NCSCS as we call it, who made this report possible. As we enter the new year, I'm so excited about where we are heading, the continued strategic alignment of NSB's 2030 vision the Biden-Harris administration priorities, and our vision for NSF is enabling tremendous progress around the country. You can see how these strategic frameworks are all focusing on key areas, such as advancing research, strengthening research benefits, and using our research capabilities to respond to challenges like the pandemic, economic recovery, and climate change focusing on accessibility and inclusion so that all the tremendous talent across our nation and beyond can become a part of the research community. Ensuring our values of transparency and reciprocity are at the center of all our international collaboration efforts and focusing on translation, technology, innovation, and partnerships. This truly is a defining moment. If you can move to the next slide, please. Thank you. I think of this as a defining moment for several reasons. Amongst those reasons, the most important ones are, it's a moment of increased global competition, which to me inspires us every day to do even more and be more excellent than we can ever be. While at the same time, as I see that global competition motivating us to do better every day, at speed and scale, that we are also in a moment of tremendous opportunity to strengthen our research enterprise by bringing in the missing millions of talent and ideas from across the socioeconomic spectrum, geography, and diversity. I want to emphasize, we also have strong bipartisan support. This is very, very important. I'm very grateful to our members of Congress on both the Senate and the House side and the staffers for the tremendous support to ensure advancement of the science and technology priorities, 
and to seize the opportunities that is in front of us so that our nation might be prosperous from a societal and economic perspective and more. What these indicators show is that we are making progress in all these areas. We are strengthening the STEM community by broadening participation, increasing our technical capabilities and workforce, and demonstrating how science and technology can enhance our economy and solve societal problems. Next slide, please. When I came to NSF in 2020, we soon laid out the vision, which essentially I would say, strengthening at speed and scale, the amazing work that NSF has been doing over the last seven decades, but also focused on some very important priorities for our nation and the scientific community. These three pillars are advancing the frontiers of research into the future. NSF has always done that very, very well. And now it's time for us to strengthen experience scale, that imperative. At the same time, we need to ensure that we have accessibility and inclusivity, as I said earlier, in STEM careers and education for everyone across the nation, everywhere. And securing global leadership, where we lead through our rich scientific values of openness, transparency, research integrity, and reciprocity, and more. This vision of the future of NSF is driven by an understanding that high quality comprehensive data is an integral part of how we design, implement, and measure our programs and activities. The high quality data set forth by reports such as the 2020 science and engineering indicators that we are previewing today are pivotal to advancing and accelerating our vision for NSF and the science and technology aspirations of our nation. In closing, I would like to thank Chair Elena Chowa, as I said earlier, a great inspiration, Chair of the Science and Engineering Policy Committee, Julia Phillips, and the entire board for that leadership and hard work. And the 2022 Science and Engineering Indicators report, which would not have been possible also with this human efforts of our staff at NSB and NCSES. So I would like to express my gratitude on behalf of NSF for all the staff and the board for their fantastic efforts, which has brought us to where we are today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Punch. So first, a little bit about the National Science Board. In its NSF governance role, the board and the NSF director work together to pursue the foundation's mission to promote the progress of science, advance the national health, prosperity, and welfare, and to secure the national defense. Board members identify issues critical to NSF's future and help establish agency policies. In its other role as advisors to the administration and Congress, the board issues reports and statements thinks broadly about the science and engineering enterprise and NSF's role within it, and works toward fostering the long-term health of science and engineering in the United States. Two years ago, the board produced a report called Vision 2030 that reflects both dimensions of the board's statutory responsibilities. In Vision 2030, we identified actions needed now to ensure that the US remains a world innovation leader a nation that provides unparalleled opportunities for all Americans, fosters mutually beneficial partnerships to deliver on research and development priorities, and where NSF continues to support the best research and people to create the knowledge that benefits us all. Indicators is used by a wide variety of people, including policymakers, researchers, and members of the media. The full report has comprehensive sections that cover education, workforce, R&D, publications, production and trade, innovation, public perceptions of science, and state level data. Key data from all of these topics are summarized in the report we're delivering today entitled The State of US Science and Engineering. With Indicators 2022, the board is again providing one-pagers for each state and the District of Columbia. The one-pagers present selected data to highlight four benchmarks of each state's s &E performance, the cost of public higher education, the size of the STEM workforce, 
investment in R&D, and venture capital funding. Performance on these measures is compared with national performance measures, showing how each state stacks up. These can be downloaded from the Indicators tab on the National Science Board's website. To make the information even more accessible, the board has also developed a variety of products. Some of these are policy neutral, and some call attention to trends that are interesting, concerning, or otherwise have policy implications. Drawing on indicators data, we have covered topics such as K through 12 STEM education, foreign born workers and students in s &E, a report on the skilled technical workforce and vision 2030. This week, we're also releasing a new policy brief entitled, the US is a keystone of global science and engineering which encapsulates the board's key takeaways from the indicators 2022 data. And my colleague, Julia Phillips, will cover this in the latter half of the presentation. So what do the most recent data show? That the US is a leader in many key indicators with some indicators showing that the strength of the US s &E enterprise lies in its central role as educator and collaborator. SE investments and capabilities are growing globally, and in some cases, the growth in other countries has outpaced that of the US. This has led to a change in America's position globally. The following will provide data highlights from the report we're releasing, followed by takeaway messages from the board. Publications output is one indicator of innovation and research activities, and a primary way to share new. SE knowledge and further invention and innovation. This graph shows the six countries with the highest output of research articles. The orange bars show data from 2010, and the blue bars show the updated 2020 numbers. There's been rapid growth in publications by authors with affiliations in China, shown on the top, and India, the third group down. China surpassed the US several years ago and became the largest producer of s &E articles globally. However, articles by authors with US affiliations remain the most highly cited, followed by those with authors with affiliations in the European Union and China. Like publications output, patenting activity has been increasing globally, leading to shifts in the shares of patenting by country over the last decade. This slide shows the percentage of international patents awarded to inventors in the top five countries or regions in 2010, shown in orange, and 2020 in blue, with the US on top and the China on the bottom. In 2020, inventors from China were granted almost half of all international patents, while the US was granted just 10%. <clears throat> Turning to higher education, this graph shows the number of s &E doctorate degrees awarded by country from 2000 to 2018. The US shown in the top blue line leads the world. However, China shown in the gray line awards almost as many as the US. Note also the steep increase in doctorates that India has awarded in recent years shown by the bright red line. It's worth noting that in some fields, more than half of the US doctoral degrees are awarded to temporary visa holders. The fields with a high proportion of foreign born students include economics, computer science, engineering, and mathematics and statistics. This figure shows the total number of international students studying science and engineering enrolled in US higher education institutions from 2012 to 2020. The blue bars represent undergraduates and the orange bars graduate students. While the US remains the top destination for internationally mobile students worldwide, US international student enrollment has declined since 2016. And this decline was much more pronounced in 2020 due to the COVID-19 pandemic. While we don't yet know the full impact of the pandemic on student enrollment, the overall declining international enrollment provides a strong impetus to both develop domestic talent and provide a welcoming environment for international students. 
This slide provides a nearly two decade view of R&D spending by country. As seen by the blue line at the top, the US leads the world in R&D spending. China's spending in the gray line has climbed from a very low base in 2000 to the second leading country in R&D spending. And together, the US at 27% of the global total and China at 23% make up half of global R&D spending. Collectively in 2019, the eight countries shown on this chart accounted for about three quarters of global R&D investment. And globally, these expenditures have tripled since 2000. Almost half of that increase comes from the populous regions of East Southeast Asia and South Asia, including China. I'd like to note a technical issue, changes in a conversion factor known as purchasing power parity. It's a measure developed and periodically updated by the World Bank that enables direct comparisons of financial measures across countries. The revision to this conversion factor between the previous edition of indicators and today's edition has led to changes in estimates of R&D expenditures for several countries, including China, India, and Brazil. Notably, the estimate for China's R&D expenditures in recent years has been revised downwards compared to the previous edition of indicators. Now that we have a sense of where the US stands on the global stage, let's look at human capital components of our SE enterprise. In line with the theme of this report, the lens through which these data are presented is based on identifying opportunities for increasing capacity or strengthening the US science and engineering enterprise. Elementary and secondary education is the foundation for overall STEM knowledge and a pathway into STEM higher education and subsequent careers. Access to experienced STEM teachers is one important factor in student performance. This figure shows the percentage of middle and high school students with three or fewer years of teaching experience <clears throat> with math teachers on the left and science teachers on the right. Less experienced STEM teachers were more prevalent among the Southern and Western regions of the US, shown in the top third of the chart in red, and in schools with high poverty rates, the middle third of the chart in green, and in schools with high minority enrollment, the bottom third uh, in blue, revealing geographic, socioeconomic, and racial or ethnic disparities in public K through 12 education. The board and our NCS partners have made a concerted effort in the last several years to update our understanding of who makes up the US STEM workforce. To that end, this year we've introduced a new definition of the STEM workforce and in indicators. It now encompasses all workers who use significant science and engineering skills in their jobs, rather than defining the workforce mostly based on degree level. Expanding our definition to include the 20 million STEM workers <clears throat> without a bachelor's degree, referred to as the Skilled Technical Workforce or STW, gives us insight into the full distribution of workers in occupations that require STEM knowledge and skills. Because today STEM matters not only for science and engineering, but also for a huge range of jobs across the economy. Using this new definition, STEM workers, over 36 million people in diverse occupations, constitute fully 23% of the US workforce. <clears throat> they work in a variety of occupations, ranging from scientists and engineers, to workers in healthcare, to those in production and construction. Since 2010, STEM jobs have grown faster than non-STEM jobs. By the end of this decade, employment in STEM occupations is projected to grow by 8%, more than double the growth for US employment overall. <clears throat> Let's dive in further on STEM worker demographics data, which exists for sex, race, and ethnicity. Overall, the data show that participation in STEM jobs by women and by Black and Hispanic workers grew from 2010, shown in orange, to 2019, in blue. 
Looking at those without a bachelor's degree, shown in the top half of the graph, we can see the growth in the participation of Black and Hispanic workers to nearly 10% and 20% respectively of the STW in 2019, close to comparable to their shares in the US working population. In contrast, women were highly underrepresented in the STW in both 2019 and 2010. Looking at those with a bachelor's degree or higher, shown in the lower half of the graph, although representation among Black and Hispanic workers grew, it was not proportionate with the overall working population. In contrast, women were nearly half of the STEM workforce with a bachelor's or higher in 2019, approaching their share of the employed US population. However, women tend to be overrepresented in the social science occupations and in lower level healthcare occupations and underrepresented among computer and mathematical science and engineering occupations. Indicators 2022 highlights areas in which building, broadening and diversifying SE capacity could strengthen the US science and engineering enterprise. To discuss the board's key takeaways from this edition of indicators, it's now my privilege to turn to our incredible team leader, Julia Phillips. Thank you so much, Ellen. As you've just heard, the indicators data show that the US and its role in the global science and engineering enterprise is at an inflection point. In our Vision 2030 report, the National Science Board provided a roadmap for what we believe is needed to ensure that the US remains a global leader in S&E and called for urgent action. We are heartened that Congress and the administration feel this same urgency and have responded with new legislation and potentially historic new investments in NSF and federal R&D more broadly. The data clearly show that no nation is the world leader in all aspects of science and engineering. Instead of one country leading in most research areas or by most science and engineering metrics, as has been true in the past, nations now lead in some research fields, but not all, and by some metrics, but not by others. This trend will continue as many more nations participate, compete, collaborate, and contribute to the sum total of human knowledge. In this world, the US no longer leads by default. This means that we must act strategically. Since across the board leadership in science and engineering is no longer a possibility, what then should our goals be? As articulated in Vision 2030, we need to first deliver benefits from research to US taxpayers and empower our nation's businesses and entrepreneurs to compete globally. Second, we need to expand the geography of innovation to ensure access to and training in S&E in every state and territory. Third, we must foster a global science and engineering community through strategic partnerships. We need to grow US international collaborations and be a reliable global partner. Finally, we must develop STEM talent for America. Our nation's greatest resource is its people. The US must be a STEM talent powerhouse by both expanding domestic talent and attracting global talent. The US must hold and strengthen its current position as a keystone of global science and engineering, an essential nexus that is instrumental to the structure and success of the global science and engineering ecosystem. A keystone bridges nations and geographic regions it connects demographic groups and disciplines, and it links sectors. These connections provide fertile ground to germinate the next breakthrough discoveries, growing them from imagination to impact. This is how our country leads now and how the US can continue to lead for decades to come. So what must we do to remain a keystone of global S&E in 2030 and beyond? How can we ensure our national security and economic competitiveness while making discoveries and producing innovations that will deliver benefits to Americans and humanity as a whole? In short, what strategic choices should the US make now? I'm going to spend the remainder of our time on five areas where the US can strategically focus 
to preserve and strengthen our position in the coming decades. First, domestic STEM talent. If the U.S. is to continue to be a global leader, we must aggressively cultivate the fullness of our domestic talent. Talent is the treasure on which the nation's prosperity, health, and security depend. The diversity of our people and the connectivity fostered among them is a wellspring of American creativity in science and engineering, both for problem solving and for asking the next big questions. But we have our work cut out for us, as this slide shows. For far too long, millions have been missing from the science and engineering enterprise. While the number of people from underrepresented groups in the S&D workforce has grown over the past decade, much faster increases will be needed for it to be representative of the U.S. population in 2030. To achieve that goal, the NSB estimates that the number of women must nearly double. Hispanics and Latinos must triple. Black or African Americans must more than double. And the number of American Indian or Alaska Native s and &E workers needs to quadruple. Faster, meaningful progress requires us to identify specific systemic disparities in the s and &E enterprise and strategically develop and implement policy interventions to bring about change. While there are a tremendous variety of STEM career pathways, almost all of them begin with primary and secondary STEM education. If we are committed to closing the gap on the missing millions, then we must address the earliest off ramps on the STEM pathway, and those are in K through 12 STEM education. Even as other countries have improved their STEM education at the K through 12 level, U.S. student performance has been lackluster. International comparisons of 15-year-old student performance are shown in the chart on the left of this slide. As you can see, the, but indicated by the right arrow, U.S. math scores have re remained below the OECD average and have hardly changed for 15 years, 2003 through 2018 compared to the majority of our most significant s and &E competitors, the U.S. places last in K through 12 student science and math performance. I find that shocking, particularly the lack of meaningful movement over that period of time. As we look more closely at the U.S. picture on the right side of the slide, we see stark and longstanding disparities in math performance based on race, Ethnicity and Socioeconomic Status, or SES. Math test scores for American fourth and eighth graders have been largely stagnant for more than a decade. Disparities in family wealth, as re reflected in children's test performance, are, are reflected in children's test performance. As the figure on the right shows, eighth grade students from low SES households, as represented by students' eligibility for free or reduced price school lunch, consistently perform significantly worse on standardized math tests compared to their peers with higher socioeconomic standing for every racial or ethnic group. In addition, the average scores of children from the missing millions racial and ethnic groups are consistently lower than their white and Asian peers at the same SES level. And as mentioned earlier, it is also important to note that inexperienced STEM teachers are more prevalent in schools with high minority and or high poverty populations. Other data in indicators show that geograph geographic disparities are also apparent in test performance, with students in the Northeast scoring higher than students in the South and West, and students in suburban schools scoring higher than students in rural, town, and urban schools. We cannot be complacent about these results. As policymakers and educators, our message must be clear. Just as illiteracy is unacceptable, it can no longer be acceptable for anyone to be bad at math. And we can no longer accept historically under-resourced and poorly supported communities and populations remaining on the margins of STEM education. If the strength of our nation lies in its capacity for scientific innovation and technology, then that future must begin with effective, high-quality K-12 STEM education for everyone.
Turning now to post-secondary education, while indicators data show a growing STEM educated population overall, a disaggregated look shows the long-term trends of demographic disparities at the post-secondary level. The graph on the left shows the breakdown of science and engineering degrees by field awarded to women in blue and men in orange from 2011 through 2019. The good news is that the number of women earning s and &E degrees has increased since 2011, and the overall percentage of women degree recipients across all fields has remained steady at about 50%. But there are significant gender differences in field of degree. A majority of the s and &E degrees earned by women have consistently been in the social and behavioral sciences, whereas this field accounts for only a quarter of the s and &E degrees earned by men. Men received a much higher proportion of degrees in engineering, physics, and computer and mathematical sciences, all fields that are particularly important and employable in high technology and emerging industries. We see similar trends at the associate's degree level, shown in the graph on the right, with a much higher proportion of degrees outside of social and behavioral science awarded to men compared to women. As we mentioned earlier, women represent about a quarter of the STEM workforce without a bachelor's degree. Associate's degrees provide an affordable and accessible entry point into the STEM workforce. We must ensure that the education and training essential to many of the industries of the future is pursued by both men and women if we are to have the workforce needed to maintain our place as a keystone of global science and engineering. College cost is a key factor in the post-secondary path chosen by students, especially for those from lower socioeconomic backgrounds. 55% of bachelor's degree recipients graduate with student debt. Students from missing millions and racial, racial and ethnic groups in particular are disproportionately likely to lack intergenerational wealth to draw on for their educational goals. Recognizing the impact of financial barriers on STEM participation, the board is committed to identifying and exploring what systematic comprehensive data exist to illuminate the impact of socioeconomic status on the pursuit and persistence in s and &E education and careers. Diversity in STEM is equally or even more problematic at the advanced degree level. Here, we see diagrams representing the proportion of doctoral degree holders from different underrepresented ethnic and racial groups in various s and &E disciplines relative to their proportion in the US population. The unfilled areas in each box for each discipline indicate the missing PhDs, the number of additional doctorates from that demographic that would be needed for the population in the field to be representative of the group's proportion in the US population. While these data are from 2018, it is important to note that over the last 10 years, there have been almost, has been almost no change in the numbers of non-white doctoral recipients, while at the same time, the number of doctoral degrees earned by white individuals has actually increased in many, many s and disciplines thus making the goal of a racially and ethnically representative s and doctoral population even more distant than before. As we redouble our efforts to broaden participation in STEM higher education, enhanced data collection, updated policies, and improved compliance in reporting demographic data by the s and community will be critical for measuring progress towards this goal. These disparities persist despite atten increased attention to diversifying s and &E in recent years. This calls all of us as s and &E leaders to look at the programs and policies we have put in place. Are they what students from underrepresented racial and gender groups and underrepresented economic or geographic backgrounds truly need to be attracted to pursue and, and, and succeed in s and &E? The message is clearly that we have much more work to do. The US science and engineering enterprise is an engine of national economic growth. The geography of s and &E in this country is diverse 
with varying strengths and opportunities from state to state. But it's important to point out that all states have strengths and opportunities. Some states have a high proportion of skilled technical workers seen here in blue. Others have a high proportion of workers with S&E degrees at the bachelor's level or above, now highlighted in pink. Many states host higher education institutions that receive a substantial amount of federal R&D funding. The top 100 are shown here in yellow dots. Some states have high rates of patenting shown in the inset. And many states have combinations of all of these features. Every state has science and engineering assets and expertise in industry, in higher education, and in the workforce. And leveraging these local and regional capabilities is key to expanding the geography of innovation. To grow our national S&E capacity, the U.S. must invest in public K-12 and post-secondary STEM education in every state and establish innovation hubs around the country. Indeed, there are real benefits to having STEM knowledge and skills. Investment in this STEM workforce is an imperative for the U.S. overall, but it also holds the potential for individual prosperity, employability, and um, increased economic success. STEM jobs pay more than their non-STEM counterparts. On average, over the past 10 years, the STEM labor force has experienced lower unemployment rates at all educational levels, a fact that became particularly relevant during the early part of the COVID-19 pandemic. As this slide shows, both STEM and non-STEM workers experienced sharp drop-offs in employment early in the pandemic in March and April of 2020, followed by a recovery through the rest of the year. STEM workers with at least a bachelor's degree, the, the solid green line at the top of this chart, experienced the smallest effect. What is particularly striking, however, is the pattern of loss and recovery in the employment for STEM workers without bachelor's degrees, shown by the dashed green line. It is very similar to the uh, to, to the path followed by non-STEM workers who had bachelor's degrees shown in the dashed orange line. They experienced far less unemployment than non-STEM workers without bachelor's degrees shown in the yellow line on the bottom of this chart. Overall, these data show the benefits of the demand for and the resiliency of STEM jobs at all educational levels, particularly during a global pandemic. Even as we develop and strengthen pathways into STEM for our domestic talent, the U.S. must continue to attract and retain foreign science and engineering talent. The U.S. has long been the premier developer of global STEM talent, due in no small part to federal support for science and engineering research, which annually funds tens of thousands of researchers and students through grants, programs, and research facilities. International students are particularly prevalent in fields that underpin critical and under emerging technologies. But the decline in the number of international students coming to the U.S. in recent years is a cause for concern. From 2008 to 2018, the number of science and engineering doctoral degrees awarded in the U.S. has increased by 25%. While more doctoral degrees were awarded to US citizens and permanent residents, seen here in green, when we disaggregate the data by field, we see that engineering, computer and mathematical sciences, and physical and earth sciences comprise less than half of those degrees. By contrast, nearly three quarters of doctoral degrees awarded to temporary visa holders, shown in purple, were awarded in those same fields. Consistently, more degrees in engineering, one of the key disciplines underpinning critical, current, and emerging technologies are awarded to international students than to domestic students. International enrollment and attracting the best and brightest from around the world is a great asset to the U.S., and we cannot afford to lose ground. Once the COVID pandemic abates, it is not a foregone conclusion 
that international students will continue to come to the U.S. at the same rates as before, as other nations increasingly offer attractive options and many students now have excellent educational and career opportunities in their home countries. To remain a magnet for international talent, the U.S. must have a clear, consistent, and predictable visa system and ensure that those who come here feel welcome and secure. Ultimately, many international students who come to the U.S. to study and stay and join the U.S. science and engineering workforce. Foreign-born individuals are a key component of our STEM workforce at the bachelor's, master's, and doctoral levels. As you can see in this chart, the share of foreign-born S&D workers has increased significantly in the last 25 years. In most S&D occupations, the higher the degree level, the greater the proportion of the workforce that is foreign-born. In many fields, foreign-born workers make up a significant percentage of the workforce with doctoral degrees, up to half or even more as shown in the lower portion of the figure. Most U.S. educated foreign S&E doctorate holders remain in the U.S. They work in R&D for large private sector companies and are employed in the same fields as their doctorates, especially math, computer science, and engineering. This inflow of international talent is invaluable to the U.S. employers who need these highly skilled workers in critical and emerging technologies to contribute to our nation's economic growth. This leads us to the third strategic focus area, critical and emerging technologies. These technologies include artificial intelligence, quantum information sciences, microelectronics, biotechnology, robotics, and space technologies. And they have been highlighted by Congress and the White House as some of the nation's top R&D priorities. They require highly trained, educated individuals to fill the jobs needed to position the U.S. for continued prosperity and security. Knowledge and technology intensive or KTI industries develop and deploy many of the critical and emerging technologies essential for current and future U.S. competitiveness. The U.S. is the largest producer of KTI services, which includes information technology, whereas China leads in KTI manufacturing. KTI Industries employed nearly one-fifth of the U.S. STEM workforce in 2019, but this critical workforce lacks the breadth of perspectives that come from a diverse set of backgrounds and experiences. As shown in this chart of 2019, only 22% of S&E workers in these industries were women, shown in the top set of bars. 16% were from underrepresented ethnic and racial groups shown in the middle set of bars. And finally, a larger percentage, just over one quarter, were foreign born shown in the bottom set of bars. In all degree fields, but particularly those that are vital to critical and emerging technologies, such as artificial intelligence and biotechnology, the US must actively embrace equity in its domestic talent development strategy Simultaneously, we must continue to attract talent from around the world. Our fourth strategic focus area is basic research and historic and continuing strength of the United States. The long-standing investment in basic research is fundamental to our country's standing as a keystone of global science and engineering enabling the U.S. to remain at the cutting edge of discovery and innovation. The U.S. continues to be the clear leader in expenditures on basic research, outspending China threefold. But while overall funding of R&D in the U.S. continues to rise rapidly, the share of basic research shown in the yellow bars funded by the federal government, shown on the left side of each pair of bars, is declining as shown in, the, in yellow green, from over half in 2010 to under 41% in 2019. While federal investment in basic research increased from 2010 to 2019 in current dollars, real expenditures have actually decreased when inflation is taken into account. This matters 
because private sector investments in basic research focus on relatively few areas that have high potential for leading to new or improved technologies in the near term, such as computing, pharmaceuticals, and transportation. It is worth remembering that today's R&D intensive industries exist in part because the federal government invested in basic research long before the research had a known application. Only the federal government has the ability and motivation to make a strategic long-term investment to create new, tech knowledge, new knowledge across all fields, supporting risks that are difficult or impossible for the private sector to undertake. Robust federal investment in basic research will ensure that a significant share of the scientific breakthroughs and innovations that will shape our global future are made in America. Our final strategic focus is collaboration. In times of crisis and opportunity alike, the world's scientists and engineers partner with their American colleagues to explore, discover, and solve those problems that all global citizens must face together. Just as keystone species hold together complex ecosystems, the United States is a critical link, link at the center of the global web of science and engineering collaboration. This position remains even as America's share of global spending on R&D has decreased. A particularly striking example of this was the strategic collaborations essential in the global effort to address the COVID-19 pandemic. Network analysis of coronavirus-related publications in 2020 shows, shown on this chart illustrates the centrality of the U.S. to the global research effort and the strong collaboration between U.S. and other researchers around the world, most notably in China and the U.K. This figure shows publications in 2020, but the output it measures is the result of years of collaborative R&D, enabling the development of vaccines in record time. Such activity clearly demonstrates the criticality of research partnerships to addressing national and global needs. The necessity of global communication and collaboration on COVID-19 continues to this day as new viral variants arise around the world. As the U.S. builds and strengthens domestic public-private partnerships to respond to a more competitive global science and engineering landscape, we must also retain and strengthen our position as a key hub of international collaboration and partnerships. These collaborations foster s and on a global scale, train the next generation of R&D workers, bring cultural, economic, and political benefits, and allow the U.S. to leverage its resources in the operation of costly, large-scale research facilities. A strong U.S. presence also promulgates and strengthens global acceptance of the core values of openness, transparency, and the ethical conduct of research. So what does it mean to be a keystone of global science and engineering? It means leaning into and strengthening international collaborations and engagements, not withdrawing from them. It means being a dependable partner and responsibly fostering open exchanges of ideas and people across fields, public and private sectors, and borders. It means being a hub of the worldwide science and engineering talent flow. It means collaborating with like-minded countries to set the values, norms, and ethics for research and for living those values ourselves. Being a keystone nation means becoming an example of a truly inclusive enterprise that welcomes and nurtures all talent, no matter what it looks like or where it comes from. It means dismantling systemic barriers that too many have faced for too long. As policymakers and leaders of the U.S. science and engineering community, we must hold ourselves and each other accountable for progress in attracting and developing the next generation of diverse STEM talent. We must work together to set meaningful goals across the educational continuum from K through 12 all the way through doctoral degrees. We must collect data 
that will allow us to measure progress, and we must be transparent, making the goals, data, and progress publicly available. As a keystone nation, the United States must be the place where all talent has the opportunity, freedom, and resources to innovate, take risks, and collaborate. A place where researchers explore without knowing in advance what discoveries may result, but sure in the knowledge that the fruits of their research will help solve societal challenges, deliver innovations today, and lay the groundwork for technological revolutions of tomorrow and bring long-term benefits to Americans and all of humanity. Thank you. We look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Julia, for going through those. And um, hopefully people have been following along in the uh, Q&A section um, because there's been uh, lots and lots of questions and, and lots of answers. And I really want to thank all the folks from NCSCS who are participating in that because they're the ones that know the sort of the full set of data that are available. Of course, which what we uh, presented today is really just a subset. So um, a few of the questions are probably a little bit more focused on the board or maybe a combination of the board and NCSES. Um, so I'll read through some of those and, and either answer them or, or uh, send them off to somebody else. So uh, one question is, how will the board prioritize the EPSCOR program that will support uh, Dr. Panchanathan's Missing Millions objective? Well, I would say we've talked quite a bit about EPSCOR in our board meetings and committee meetings. Um, as you noted from our Vision 2030 report, one of the four main areas that uh, we felt needed looking at was expanding the geography of innovation. And the EPSCOR program certainly has been one that has worked on that for a number of years and produced uh, a lot of good uh, results and information. We think it can do an even better job and NSF is uh, in agreement with us. And in fact, they have an effort going on right now um, to uh, really a visioning activity for the future of EPSCOR at NSF and have been inviting public comments. And I will see if uh, Perhaps Punch is interested in saying anything more about that. No, thank you very much, Ellen. You're absolutely correct that um, this is a major priority for both the board and the foundation, and we are working in partnership to ensure that we make tangible progress through our existing programs that are working, that we know that are working, that we are trying to scale even more by investing more in that, and also working with partnerships with at several levels with K-12 institutions, with community colleges, with the universities, and more to make sure that we're able to scale this fast and also diversify this fast all across the nation. And also looking at new programs and new initiatives that, uh, uh, that Chair Ochoa talked about that we're working together on. So you will see a lot of that happening in the next uh, months and years to come. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I also note that a number of people commented um, positively on the expanded definition of the STEM workforce. And that is something that uh, the board um, has really been involved with, uh, along with NCSCS. And um, I'll call your attention to a report that we put out in 2019 on the skilled technical workforce. And um, that task force within the board was headed up by our now vice chair, uh, Dr. Victor McCrary. And so I think we on the board have all learned a lot about that and NCSCS has been great about under looking for and starting to pull in data um, on that part of the workforce that we previously hadn't really focused on. Um, here's one that um, again, Pancha may ask you to comment on, but I'll say a few things. Um, how has the US addressed preparation of elementary educators to teach math and science? Um, those struggling 15-year-olds were elementary school students once, and you know how are teachers prepared to deal with this? So while K through 12 isn't the primary purview of either the NSF or the NSB, we all understand the importance of it um, as we look at higher education and the STEM workforce, and uh, and in fact um, the board uh, at as we noted, put out a policy paper on K through 12 STEM education. And we do look to some of the experts within NSF 
where their, um, their focus is really, for example, on um, funding re research in how you teach uh, science and math at K through 12. And NSF also does fund um, some, what I would call informal um, education or uh, outreach to students in those areas. Panch, would you like to talk about that? Uh, I think you've covered it very well. What I would say is that, that our Education Human Resources Director, DHR Director, has a plethora of programs that addresses at various levels, as you talked about the learning itself as one facet, but also engagement uh, through various programs, including um, you know, internships, training of uh, science teachers, um, and working with university and, and, and teachers colleges within universities for the teachers of the future. Uh, all of those things are being addressed at the same time through various programs. I welcome people to um, contact us and we'll be happy to point them to the resources that is available. Uh, but this is a great priority for us. And this is where, again, I emphasize the word partnership because NSF doing it alone is one thing, but we're also working with other agencies like NASA, for example, in this important imperative that we want to have you know, much, many more K-12 teachers and students inspired in STEM. And we're also going to be working even more intensely with, um, uh, with K-12 systems uh, across the nation so that we are able to get better prepared teachers and also continuing training of teachers. Uh, we are even talking to some foundations to see if there will be some partnership possibilities in terms of scaling this all. Thank you. Look, I'm looking through some of the other questions here. Um, so one of them is just talking about trying to understand uh, what we are looking at or learning about retention uh, of students in higher education and then in the workforce, um, and particularly about uh, maybe workforce uh, climate and um, issues of harassment or hostile activity. So first of all, I would say there's a lot more information about STEM pathways um, in the STEM labor report, which you can find in full on the NCSCS website. And that gives you maybe a, a first look at some of the retention. This is something that we've been asking questions about as well on the board. Um, one of the positive steps that NSF took a few years ago, I think in 2018, um, was uh, putting a terms and conditions clause um, into their grants um, related to harassment. Um, and uh, uh, it actually uh, re responds to any kind of harassment that is protected. Um, so sexual, racial, um, and that kind of thing. And allows NSF to work with a university who um, has done an investigation, for example, um, of a researcher there uh, associated with an NSF grant. Uh, Panch, any, any other comments on that? No, this is something that we take very, very seriously. I'm very grateful to my predecessor, Dr. Franz Cordova, who put together a very strong set of guidelines uh, in terms of how we handle harassment situations and also guidances for our institutions to, and working in partnership with institutions to be able to handle this. Um, I think we are making progress and uh, there is in all of these things, as you all know, there's more work always to be done and we are fully committed, fully committed as a board and the foundation working together to make sure that harassment has no place in terms of um, you know, uh, advancing uh, individual aspirations uh, in, 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 in wanting to achieve great things for our nation, for, for the individuals as well as for our nation. So you can be rest assured that uh, we'll be continuously focused on this and, uh, and addressing them uh, proactively and reactively both. Thank you. Um, I think we have time maybe for one last question. And uh, one came in that asked about what are the main levers that could be pulled to increase US students' participation in STEM. Um, so uh, again, that's something that we've looked at at, at, at the board. And um, certainly one of the issues which affects higher education in general, but certainly STEM is financial barriers. And uh, maybe I'll ask Julia to just mention um, some of the work that they're doing in her committee, uh, because we're looking at putting out a policy report on that. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Ellen. Yes, uh, the, um, the Science and Engineering Policy Committee of the National Science Board has been looking at a number of issues that are highlighted um, in the briefing we gave today. And one of those that we just barely touched on today has to do with the financial barriers to STEM participation, 
by those from the missing millions and um, more broadly, those also from lower socioeconomic um, populations. Um, and the issue of student debt is a huge one there. Another one, as you start looking at more at the advanced um, degrees, is that um, for students that don't have uh, uh, reservoirs of financial resources, the um, stipends for graduate students are very modest. Many of many students, uh, particularly from the missing populations that we're dealing with, um, have um, dependents that they need to help support. And there are other career paths um, that do not involve graduate education that are more fin financially rewarding in the short term. And many of these individuals can't afford to wait for the long term for a financial return. So those are all issues that we are looking at. Um, I anticipate that there might actually be a series of um, reports or short, short statements that come out from the board on these topics. Um, and the first one on um, the, on financial barriers, um, I expect to come out uh, relatively soon. Thank you, Julia. And Panch, I'll just give you uh, one final word if you would like to also address barriers that could be pulled to increase US students' participation in STEM. No, thank you so much, And This goes back to the missing millions focus that we talk about. Uh, fundamentally, I, I, I know, and uh, the board members have heard this many times and across the nation, I'm sharing this everywhere I go. Uh, we have unbelievable talent and ideas. I'm the, I've seen this firsthand in a previous role that I took uh, before I came to NSF. The amazing ideas and talent that is across our nation, across all geographies, across all socioeconomic spectrum of uh, talent that is there, as well as um, you know the diversity of talent that we have across our nation. So one of the principal focus that we have in addressing that is to make sure that we are uh, taking those programs, as I said earlier, that are already focused on bringing out the talent also focus on institutions that are bringing out the talent at scale and see how we might support those institutions so that we might be able to get this talent inspired. And at the same time, making sure that, you know, uh, people, people understand that this is a, a, a set of a pipeline and pathways kind of an approach. It is not, you know, it, in one place, it is in all places. So there again, the partnerships a term that I used earlier is being used uh, as, as a mechanism of um, accelerating progress. So uh, you will see this in the programs that NSF has already launched, but keep an eye out. The only thing I would say is keep an eye out. Uh, what, uh, please look at the NSF website constantly because we're coming out newer programs and newer frameworks to address this uh, important, important um, uh, element of talent, uh, domestic talent being uh, brought out in full force and full scale. And then of course, welcoming global talent at full force and full scale. Both of that are required. I saw some of the questions here. Both of that is required for us to be in the vanguard of competition and address some of the uh, you know, key points that came out of the keystone points that came out of the science and educators report that was nicely presented uh, by both Ellen and Julia. Thank you so much. Thank you, Punch. Uh, thank you so much for your leadership. Uh, thank you, Julia, for your leadership of your committee and getting out this report. Huge thanks to all the folks at NCSCS. And if you followed along in the Q&A, um, most of the questions that asked are there data on, they came back with a link to a report. So um, there is so much more that's available uh, than what we were able to talk about today. Thank you to everyone for joining us. We really appreciate it.